I'm Richard Ingram. We're here on Lafayette Square, LaGrange, Georgia, in front of this magnificent statue of General Lafayette. Today's his birthday, 264 years old. In fact, today is Lafayette Day all over the state of Georgia by proclamations from the House, the Senate, and the Governor. Whenever we talk about ideals, whenever we strive to achieve them, however imperfectly, we are in the spirit of Lafayette. Lafayette stands for liberty, equality, and justice, the three great ideas we act on. He stands for respect and reciprocity, the two things necessary for a democracy to flourish. And he stands for courage and gratitude, the two basic building blocks of character. So listen up. You're going to hear about James Armistead Lafayette and about Lafayette's at LaGrange. I'll be back. Hi, I'm Chloe Harrell from LaGrange, Georgia. For Lafayette, farming was noble. This was not always so. Early in his life, English agronomist Arthur Young would have called him an absentee landlord. Lafayette's land in Agravere and Brittany was a source of much of his wealth. But he had no familiarity with what peasants endured who paid rent to him. Young traveled France and was critical of his arrangement, finding in it the source of rural poverty. Demands levied at distance on farm workers were equally subverse of agriculture and the common rights of man. He laid blame squarely on landowners. The nobility in France have no more idea of practicing agriculture and making it an object of conversation, except on the mere theory than any other object the most remote of their habits and pursuits. Lafayette, for his part, had never thought about it. The beginning of awareness for Lafayette may have been the Society of Cincinnati. Organized in 1783 by Henry Knox, its first president was George Washington. Lucius Cincinnatus in the 5th century BCE was called from his plow by the Roman Senate and given absolute power. Afterwards, the enemy subdued, the battle won, Cincinnatus could have elected to keep the scepter and maintain the perks of power. Instead, he traded his power for his plow and returned to his fields. It was farming elevated to noble art and fresh philosophy. It comprehends Shakespeare's sonnet 94. They that have power to hurt and will do none. The society itself was intended to keep Continental Army officers, French and American, in touch. It still exists today. Less than a year after the Treaty of Paris in 1783 ended the American Revolutionary War, Lafayette disembarked the Courrier de New York at Manhattan on August 4, 1784. This was a five-month, nine-state visit to America. On September 14th in New York, Mayor James Duane and the Common Council presented Lafayette with a gold box in which was a certificate declaring him admitted and received a free man and citizen of the city of New York. Lafayette and his traveling companion, 18-year-old Chevalier de Carmen, captain in the Nuiah Dragoons, visited the eastern seaboard from Virginia to New Hampshire. On August 17, 1784, they arrived for a 10-day stay at Mount Vernon. Lafayette left the grounds only once to see locals at a nearby Lomax Tavern, Alexandria, Virginia. Laura Arricchio, in her book, The Marquis, says Lafayette observed how Washington had turned his retirement into an expression of personal values, which was itself an embrace of Horace, who said, Blessed is he who, leaving business behind him, works his life out on his ancestral land among the cattle. Washington rode often over his five farms covering 8,000 acres and worked by 200 enslaved. Lafayette, in a letter dated February 5, 1783, proposed to Washington a plan to emancipate blacks. Exactly two months later, Washington replied favorably to the plan and looked forward to talking about the details in person. This 10-day visit in 1784 would have been the occasion for the face-to-face. -face. We do not know the content of that talk. But one year later, Lafayette launched his own project of emancipation in Cayenne, French Guiana. Washington was dedicated to finding new and better ways of farming. He experimented. Crop rotation, fertilizer, Lafayette took note. I will yield to the example of the true Cincinnatus, he wrote to his wife, Adrienne. In 1791, done with politics for the moment, he returned to his ancestral home, the Chateau de Chavanac, in the Avergne, 300 miles south of Paris an 18-room fortress built in the 14th century. It burned in 1701 and was rebuilt without modification. It still looked like a fortress. 
Here he helped give the region an example of the best agriculture and to raise there the most necessarily types of animals. This manner of serving my neighbors would have been useful in the interest of peace. He recruited Antoine Laurent Thomas Vaudier to redesign the grounds. Vaudier stayed 12 months from mid-October 1791 through late October 1792. John Dyson was a farmer from Suffolk, England. Recruited by Lafayette to supervise crops and livestock, he stayed at Chavignac for most of 1792. The French Revolution brought the Chavignac experiment to a close. On August 19, 1792, Lafayette was imprisoned as an enemy of the state. His lands were confiscated. One of the wealthiest men in Europe now had nothing. For five years, most of it at Olmolts, Lafayette was imprisoned, part of it in solitary confinement. Napoleon negotiated Lafayette's release from the Austrians, but fearing his popularity, Napoleon exiled him. Not until 1799 did Lafayette return to France. Lafayette's political colleague, Francois Alexandre Frederick, had traveled England and met Arthur Young. Young was a reformer. He argued that rural poverty in England could be mitigated by improving farming methods. Francois followed the English model. Lafayette took note. He also read Arthur Young. While Lafayette was in exile, Adrienne returned to France and managed to reclaim her ancestral home, 35 miles east of Paris, the 700-acre Chateau de la Grange. This, too, had been confiscated when Lafayette was imprisoned, but Adrienne argued the state down, rightly claiming La Grange to be her family's property. Her mother, Henriette, Duchess Diane, died on the guillotine July 22, 1794, at the height of the Reign of Terror. Adrienne escaped the same fate only through the intervention of American minister James Monroe. From exile at Vienne, May 29, 1799, Lafayette wrote Adrienne to ask about Lagrange. He wanted to know about the house, farm, woods, and park. He was, he said, more immersed than ever in the study of agriculture, and all the details that you will send me will give me the pleasure of comparing practices in France with those of England and Holland. Again, from Utrecht, October 29th, 1799, he writes to Teller, My activity will focus on agriculture, which I study with all the ardor that I had in my youth for other occupations. The pump was primed, and in 1799, without Napoleon's endorsement, he slipped into France, settled at Lagrange, and launched his vision. First, he recalled Vidor to redesign roads, irrigations, and inside of the chateau. For landscaping around the chateau, he hired Hubert Robert. Robert transformed the moat of an intimidating defense to an inviting, meandering stream. Pines and cypress took the edge off the imposing towers. Islands of oak and elm dotted the perimeter. Historian Arricchio reports that Lafayette was purchased 6,500 trees for 134 acres of woods and park, including chestnut, maple, ash, and poplar. This was for one year alone, 1806 through 1807. In 1807, he bought 203 pear trees and 165 apple trees. The same year, Adrienne died. Around the chateau were 416 acres of fields and 70 acres of pasture. Cabbage, turnips, green vegetables, barley, oats, beans, and wheat all rotated according to the latest and best practices. Lafayette's study was in a corner tower with a vista view of the grounds. His desk was in an alcove of the study. The whole of it was designed by Voudier. From here, he could oversee the workings. He had a bullhorn at hand by which he gave directives. The library was cataloged by subject. Under agriculture were 76 books, including writings by Arthur Young. Jules Cloquet, Lafayette's longtime personal physician, said his flock of merinos were the first and finest ever introduced into France, about a thousand of them. There were 30 to 40 cows, some of which came from the United States. Lafayette slept seven hours. He went to bed at 10 or 10.30 p.m. and he awakened at 5 a.m. He would read or write in bed for a couple hours before dressing. He paid respects to his wife every morning and would not be disturbed for any reason during these moments. He engaged in letter writing until 10 when he came to breakfast. He read journals till noon. Then he went to the farm for two to three hours, returning about 3 p.m. He took care of correspondence and other business until six, when a bell announced dinner. The food was nearly always entirely homegrown. 
Evenings he spent in the drawing room with family until 8 p.m. when he returned to his study to read. If guests were still present, he would retire at 10.30 p.m. Lagrange required 16 to 18 servants for farmers' assistants, cowkeepers, and shepherds. During the day, 30 or 40 workmen were on the grounds, expanding to 70 or 80 in seasons of harvest. Every Monday, 200 pounds of bread baked at the farm were distributed to the indigent, in scarce times, 600 pounds per week. Lafayette transformed Lagrange into his own image to reflect his own philosophy. Lafayette spent winters in Paris. On May 9, 1834, he caught a cold. He never recovered. He died at 4.30 a.m. May 20, 1834. Whenever Lafayette introduced visitors to Lagrange, he would exclaim, Now, we are on American ground. Happy birthday, General Lafayette. You are looking at one of the best rogues of the Revolutionary War. Early in my career, I worked for Colonel John Armstead II. I was a companion to the Colonel's son. We both studied French and English. My education allowed me to be a great worker in the taverns, but I heard slaves could apply for freedom after serving in the Continental Army. I volunteered for the Army at the age of 33. My intelligence was recognized by Lafayette. He said I had a great aptitude, so I was given the job of spy. The job was thrilling because if I was caught, I could be hanged. As a spy, I couldn't just walk around with identifying papers. Speaking of almost getting caught, I relayed information to Lafayette that almost resulted in Benedict Arnold's capture. Another exciting mission involved Yorktown. I got to know Cornwallis in July of 1781 when I was serving as a servant to him. When you are a spy, you have to be calm under pressure and make everyone you speak to feel at ease. I gave Lafayette intel regarding Cornwallis' plan, regarding his military strategies. Well, Cornwallis got a little too comfortable because he would surrender on October 19, 1781. When Cornwallis saw my smiling face, he said, Oh, you rogue, they been employing me a trick all this time. Getting my freedom after espionage days would prove difficult. But I thank Lafayette for writing a testimony, vouching for my service. Once free, I got married to my lovely wife and began farming. I am James Armstead, Lafayette. Happy birthday, General Lafayette. Lafayette is all about daring. Lafayette had style. His motto was Cuanon, which is Latin for why not? But he wasn't haphazard. In Lafayette's day, the 18th century, smallpox killed more people than bullets. People knew about inoculation, but as a matter of preventing catastrophic disease, it wasn't a given, which is to say it was contentious. And in fact, it wasn't until May 14, 1796, that Edward Jenner in England first inoculated eight-year-old James Phipps, the gardener's son, with scrapings from milkmaid Sarah Nelm's hands as she had caught cowpox, which is the animal variant of smallpox, from a cow named Blossom. Jenner didn't write his first paper until 1798. 20 years before, at the Trianon Palace in Versailles. King Louis XV was having dinner with his favorite paramour, the Madame du Barry, and he became suddenly and violently ill. He broke out in blisters. He had smallpox. Within two weeks, on May 10, 1774, he died. It was a gruesome death, and Lafayette was there. He was 16 years old, and he saw it. Lafayette knew about inoculation. He had a decision to make. Lafayette had a process. He said, I read, I study, I examine, I listen, and I reflect. And then I try to put into an idea all the common sense that I can. Lafayette made that decision. He rented a cottage five miles outside of Paris in Shiloh. 
He took his wife, Adrian, with him and his mother-in-law, Henriette, just in case. And he had himself inoculated. It turned out to be a great call. It prevented him from suffering the ravages of smallpox three years later when he was at Valley Forge. Lafayette is relevant even and especially today. Happy birthday, General Lafayette.